Good evening, my friends. This is Mark Evans. Mark Evans, Vice President for Public Affairs of Metro Media Incorporated, with opinion in the Capitol, originating in our main studios here in Washington, D.C. The increase of crime has become a major concern to virtually every city, town, and hamlet in these United States. As a matter of fact, it's become a worldwide problem. Newspapers discuss it, legislators debate it, citizens deplore it. The police officer on the beat has to do something about it. He is charged with the responsibility of protecting law-abiding citizens and detecting the lawbreaker. We have with us today three police officers from various parts of the United States, major cities, important cities, cities suffering from the crime wave, Washington, New York, and Los Angeles. These modern-day lawmen have come to the nation's capital as delegates to the 11th Annual National Conference of Police Associations, a meeting to discuss common problems and mutual benefits. I'd like you to have you meet them. Lieutenant Robert D. Cutts of the Los Angeles Police Department is president of his city's Fire and Protective League and newly elected president of the National Conference of Police Associations. He's a veteran police officer and a teacher of police administration. Patrolman John Cassess of New York City is president of the New York City Patrolman's Benevolent Association with a membership of 26,000 policemen. He is also newly elected vice president of the National Association as is George Whaler, our third guest, who heads the District of Columbia Policemen's Association, an organization comprising all of Washington's police forces, including the White House and Park Police. Patrolman Whaler is well known to Washington school children for his lectures on safety. Now, in just a moment, we shall talk with these three police officers about their work, their responsibilities, their problems, and their goals. Opinion in the Capitol is very proud to have you gentlemen here, particularly in view of the fact of the national, the national problem that faces all cities. And we're wondering just what uh, you have in common, if the crime is common to all of you and the problems uh, incident to crime. I suspect the biggest problem on your shoulders at the moment, and this certainly is true of you uh, here in Washington, uh, Patrolman Whaler, is the racial situation. With 100,000 people predicted to come to Washington, uh, and a demonstration, and certainly New York and Los Angeles have had their share of these. Where does the policeman fit into all of this? How does how does he uh, he 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 can't win as I see it? Well, I think our policemen. Excuse me. Right. I, I think our policemen uh, in Los Angeles uh, feel that if these uh, demonstrations are orderly. Uh, and that they are conducted within the scope of our laws and ordinances and that the uh, rights and property of our citizens are, are uh, protected. Uh, uh, we don't uh, have any reason to object uh, from the standpoint of law enforcement to the individual officer in the street I'm talking about now, uh, except he's, un he's incapacitated by having to work unusual overtime hours, and this seems to be his daily routine anyway. Yes, but inevitably you see the... The cameraman focused on a policeman with a dog, and uh, some uh, uh, Negro is on the ground with a dog with his jaws wide open. Now, uh, the, the policeman is second only to the dog in the, in the uh, unpleasantness of that picture. This type of tactic is, we think, is highly unfair to our officers, and it's been something we've experienced on occasions where the officer has been put in a derogatory position to the detriment of all law enforcement. Uh, I think that uh, in Los Angeles we've seen it. Uh, it might make good copy, but it certainly uh, is detrimental to the image of law enforcement. As a you whole. face this problem in New York, surely. I, I think. Uh, I think if a policeman breaks out even today in any situation, he may be confronted. But he's doing very good, doing very well. At one time, a policeman could take action as a policeman should under specified conditions, but through the years because of so-called do-gooders. Uh, the image of the law enforcement officer has uh, has come down a lot. What do you mean when by do-gooders? Well, I mean, people who think that a policeman should not uh, use uh, force, even though he's using force legally under new conditions and uh, under certain circumstances where he is allowed to use force to overcome whatever resistance a, uh, a person he is about to arrest puts up. Notwithstanding this, the attitude is, uh, of the public today in some cycles is that the uh, this shouldn't be, no matter what. We've had occasion in New York City last year on numerous occasions where 
policeman in effectuating an arrest uh, had to, to put up more with the people surrounding the area who were about to gang up on him for doing his job because he was arresting someone who had committed a crime. It don't seem right, it don't seem possible. It seems unbelievable, but it did happen in New York City. Well, you're going to face a problem here. Uh, I don't know if it would be a problem or not. Well, I, I don't uh, personally anticipate any any problem. I think that uh, if everyone remembers that uh, the police officer's job is to enforce the laws, and as long as uh, uh, you don't violate the laws, we have no interest in you whatsoever, regardless of who you are. Well, aren't you facing the problem, though, that everybody is uh, aware of the law? But the demonstrators, uh, they're going to be peaceful. At least they claim to be going to be peaceful, but it's pretty soon somebody's arrested. Now, where... I, I think seen that's blood. an interesting statement. You say that everybody's aware of the law. Uh, I think even our uh, high courts today are a little confused. Uh, Mr. Evans says, well, I'm what talking is about the, the specific no. racial uh, demonstration laws. Yes, yes. Nobody knows all the laws, that's for sure. Well, that's one of the problems in our country. about the constant change in the interpretation of the law, you see. Yeah. Uh, we've had such changes that the police officer in the street is called upon to make these decisions in seconds when these august uh, bodies of. Uh, of uh, legal minds uh, meet for months to contemplate the issue that transpired in a matter of seconds. Well, this is an area that people are not really, uh, don't take cognizant of. That policeman has to make a snap judgment, right. whereas the courts have months. I, I think that's a wonderful point. They can argue about it and, uh, and, and uh, check back in various law books as far as they want and the Constitution and everything. And then but we have to uh, make the decision, like Bob says, immediately. Are the courts doing their job in your estimation, and I wish you'd be brutally frank on this, if you think they are or if they are not. Don't all speak uh, yeah, I, I, I think the general, general attitude amongst my officers in Los Angeles is that there's a lot to be desired in the courts. Uh, Lack of stringency? We feel that our courts are honest in California, but on the other hand, we feel they're too liberal. We feel that the officer too often is on trial. The officer's the, on trial. The officer appears to be on trial. The emphasis of the defendant's case seems to be placed upon what did the officer do, not what did the defendant do. And, of course, we feel that this has a bad uh, impact on the attitude of our policemen over the years uh, who are constantly harassed uh, on a witness stand under the protection. The, the insulting remarks that are addressed to him uh, are apparently... Uh, and given the sanction or at least the protection of the of the court. Our New York City law? Uh, yes, we, we, we find it the same way because uh, sometimes you find out that the patrolman who has made the arrest finds himself on trial to, to the uh, attitude of the court and he finds out that uh, no sooner does he arrest someone and he goes back on patrol, he sees the same person walking the streets again committing the same crime and he figures, well, here we go again. We'll have to arrest this fellow for whatever crime he has committed now. But well, why Why are not the courts? Why are they not uh, more... Uh... Well, I believe that the attitude is to rehabilitate, and when a man has done something wrong, to give him a second chance. But in many, many cases, we find out that the fellow who has been paroled or is out uh, after having committed some crime commits a more serious crime later on. What would you suggest? What If you were a judge, what would you do? I'd... Uh, Depending on the crime committed, I'd hold it. Uh, I'd, I'd keep him in as long as uh, I thought it was fit. If, if, if the crime calls for so many years of uh, incarceration, then I would, uh, depending on condition, depending on the crime as committed, depending on his background, depending on his past performances, I would throw the book at him, so to speak. Because I find out as a, as a lawman, as a policeman, so many people that we do arrest, Go out once again and commit the same crimes, as I said before, of a more serious nature. This gets down to the parole situation, Wait, too, then, doesn't it? Yes. Mark, you know, uh, one thing um, about uh, what John is talking about, locally here, we, uh, we feel that uh, the courts could be uh, stiffer. We think that the laws are adequate, uh, but they are uh, interpreted so uh, to give minor uh, sentences. And it seems rather odd that you go to Maryland or Virginia, the two adjoining states, and the sentences for the same particular things uh, that happen are uh, much stiffer. 
Well, if you had the choice, I'm sure you'd rather have more leniency on the court than too, too stringent, or would you? Oh, absolutely. Right. We'd really oh, well, right. I mean, we don't want to uh, probably anybody... Uh, uh, yeah. I think, uh, but, uh, but there are cases where they are a little too lenient, you know. I, I, we've seen them. I've seen fellows that have been arrested and come out and they're no better off than they were is before. This, is this quite demoralizing to a police officer? Well, it sure is. It sure is. Is, he, is he less effective when he goes out on the duty on duty again, knowing that he hasn't uh, the teeth well, in his... You, you can rest assured all the time he has put into it, in a court case and preparing it and testifying and so forth and so on, on his own time. I Let me give you an example of some of the discouraging aspects our policemen face. Say, for example, a citizen, you, Mr. Evans, walk up to a police officer Leave in our city. Leave me out of this, will you? <laughs> and you, I mean as a, as a, as a citizen right, who has been a, a witness something, and you uh, point out to a police officer that a man accosted you and identify that man as having approached you to sell narcotics. Now, the officer is expected by you and the rest of the citizens under these circumstances to go up and immediately uh, search this man and ascertain whether he has narcotics on him and subsequently place him under arrest if he does. Such is not the case. The minute the officer searches this man, he violates this man's rights of illegal search under the Cayenne case in California, and of course, evidence is illegal and narcotics is a crime of possession. So you have no case. Well, you're, you're, we're getting right down to the case of the problem here, then. That is the apathy of the public generally. Aren't they back of the courts, the back of the, uh, the policemen, and back of everybody else? Is it the I public that's lethargic? The legal profession here comes into the act. Uh, this takes in all your attorneys as well. Uh, here, we like to do things a little differently than the country from which we inherited our judicial process. And here, we tend to, in many instances, uh, make too many loopholes or legal gymnastics, as has been referred to by many authors. Uh, for these people to manipulate the cases around. Opinion in the Capitol is focusing its attention on national law enforcement by interviewing three working police officers from three different parts of the country. Lieutenant uh, Cutts of Los Angeles, Patrolman Cassas of New York, and George Whaler, who is a police officer here in Washington, D.C. We'll continue with this interesting discussion about the problems of law enforcement, particularly in reference to national problems in just a moment. As I mentioned a few moments ago, our officers are from Los Angeles, New York, and Washington, D.C., officers Cutts, Casas, and Whaler. I would like uh, to find a common definition, or if there is one, on police brutality. This is, this is a uh, well-used term. I'm not sure I know what it means. What is police brutality? Uh, back in the old days, I guess it used to be laying it on the back, but... Uh, could mean anything, Mark. Uh, a bill was introduced last year in Congress, which uh, we think fortunately, uh, which we opposed, by the way, uh, didn't uh, pass, which made uh, almost anything police brutality, even uh, to the extent of the inflection of the voice. Or, um, you, are you serious? I mean, you... I'm serious, and there's another bill introduced almost... Uh, there's nothing physical anymore about police brutality? I well, mean, uh, police, police brutality, uh, for the most part, is uh, physical uh, action, but uh, it could mean almost anything the way of the proposed... Uh, is this a problem in all your areas? Yes. It's a New problem York? in our area, too. You've got to realize that the, uh, the policeman's there to enforce the law, to preserve the peace, to aid the sick, to arrest perpetrators... And he has to carry out his duties the way he sees fit, all things being equal. But you find out somewhere along the line that there are those who will cry police brutality. He can be legally being uh, using force, but notwithstanding this, there are groups, even in our city, who will make it a point to make sure that this is brought up under the mm -hmm. uh, most advantageous uh, situations, that uh, even in favor of the police. Well, there are times when a man can lose his temper and, and, and provide some brutality. Won't you admit that, or is that... Well, I mean, uh, you, you've got to realize we've got 26,000 policemen now. If there is such a man and he does lose his temper and does what is not correct and not proper and not right and does use police brutality, then we are in favor of taking appropriate action against this man. What does the New York uh, uh, police code say in connection with police brutality? How much uh, force are you allowed to use on a man? Well, uh, the law says that you are allowed to use just enough force and overcoming whatever resistance he may put up in your effectuating an arrest. Now, how would you now, put now, verbal well, brutality that's it. in Now, arrest. you tell me in a situation like this where you have a fellow coming at you with a knife or something, now you tell me just how much uh, 
force you must use to overcome this resistance, whatever it may be. Yeah. Now, inadvertently, sometimes a fellow kills a man. A policeman does. Mm -hmm. And then they holler, police brutality, no reason for it. Well, the fellow was about to kill him with a knife. You see, now, how, 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 where, where's this thin line of uh, figuring just what is legal and what isn't at the time? Are police departments subjected to much pressure, uh, political pressure? Uh, this is, I, I'd like to make this a blanket question. Uh, it probably differs in various cities. Washington doesn't have the political pressures, and yet it not, has all the political uh, pressures. Not, uh, I don't imagine we have the same political pressures like they have uh, in, in their various states. I'm talking about promotions. I'm talking about uh, being backed up by the courts, the general police uh, pressures. From I'd like to say in Los Angeles, civil liberties that, uh, groups we feel free of political pressure, but we do have pressure from what you're talking about. We have self-serving groups, uh, groups that uh, are furthering causes uh, uh, which they uh, feel necessary, apparently, to their uh, way of life. And uh, certainly we're subjected to pressures all the time from these groups, people who uh, have a tendency to uh, cast us in the in the image of the authoritarian uh, despot or uh, something of this nature, you know. The brutal type of individual that every police officer has an ulterior motive that he's going to get some sort of a gratuity if he arrests so many bodies uh, or writes so many traffic citations. Well, this is utterly ridiculous. This is not true? This is not true. In any city? It would be uh, quite a, a sought-after job, work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, this is a general consensus. Now, I didn't believe it myself, but I wanted to re-emphasis on it. Right. In Los Angeles, we function, and uh, I think this is pretty nationwide, on a selective uh, enforcement problem predicated upon excellent experience. And I think that all of our cities are, have reached that stage of the game. We no longer endorse the officer that hides out behind the signal or the signboard. Uh, we, we don't have enough men now. We can't stand to have them hiding behind signboards. I mean, this is something that's... Uh, and yet this is still charged against us uh, from back in the history of police. And, uh, you, you together have served in a cruel period of uh, about 60 years. More or less. Uh, are police officers today better equipped, in your estimation? Are they better prepared than they were when you started, what, 22 years ago? Or no. was it you 22 years? 26. Well, 26 they may have been. Oh, yeah. They may be better prepared today, <coughs> but I think that they did a job much better years ago under said conditions. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood. What I mean is, years ago, the policeman could do his job, enforce the law, but today, as uh, Bob Cuts from L.A. has said, there are, there are these, uh, these uh, pressure groups uh, that uh, use their influence as they see fit to try and hamper the work of a policeman. Well, the policeman's not posture has suffered then. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't occupy the position that no, he wants occupied. Not, 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 not today, when in New York City you find out that uh, teenagers and little hoods and punks uh, jeer at him and actually... Uh, spit at him and uh, talk uh, fresh to him and don't give him the respect that the uniform calls for as it did years ago. And uh, years ago, he, he was the law, and when he came down that street and you were misbehaving, you knew it and you respect him. But why but is this deteriorating? What's, what's happened? What's caused this? Well, I think uh, through the, the years... Or, uh, the policeman or the public? Or no, I, I think it's the apathy on the part of the public and on the apathy of the part of the do-good, essentially. Because even in school, like... Like teachers today now, and that's a good example with both. And it goes for a policeman. As I talk for one, I'll talk for the other. If a teacher today puts a little hand on a child, and he probably deserves what when she does give him give him a little spank, spanking, the, the mothers and the fathers and all the relations are up in arms. Now I think a little pat on the back like that goes a long way to making this a better citizen and uh, a citizen that will respect its elders. And the same thing goes for the police department. Now, there are times that uh, and these punks and teenagers know it. All you have to do is make a complaint against the police department. You can get in, in our city, pick up a telephone and call a police station and just say that officer number so-and-so has done this, that, and the other thing. An anonymous call by anyone starts a chain reaction on, in our department where the man is brought down for questioning and so forth and so on. Now, this is demoralizing. And it goes a long way toward making our police department more ineffectual. Is it getting worse? Ineffective. Is it getting well, worse? Fortunately, under the new commission that we have now, Michael Murphy, back home, we seem to get a little more support. Mm -hmm. Because we've had instances where our policemen went out there and did a job. And when complaints came in against them, he really studied the situations, 
and uh, looked at the circumstances. And uh, when we deserved the backing, he was there to back us up. He didn't take this indiscriminate attitude of saying white police are always wrong. This is by way of parentheses, but uh, this man is a patrolman, and he took on a police commissioner one time. Well, <laughs> I won't go into that, but uh, we just fight for our rights. You do have a new police God. commissioner in New York, don't you? <laughs> Thank God we get along with him. Too. With twenty-six thousand men back of you, I That's guess right, it made right. it more effective. He's a good man. Though. What uh, what makes a man want to be a police officer uh, with all these problems facing him? I'm sure you have recruitment problems, don't you? You with twenty-six thousand men, you with uh, eight thousand. No, or 3,000? Uh, you with 8,000? 26,000. Well, uh, our recruitment problem uh, was such that uh, you could walk into any uh, into a high school any Saturday morning since January all through the end of March and, May and April and take an examination. Every Saturday it was open to any, ap any applicant. And uh, once having passed the examination, then they'd see if you were interested in it and they'd uh, give you the physical and the medical and so forth. Have any of you detected, uh, and be again brutally frank, television or movies or uh, funny papers or whatever it is affecting uh, crime one way or the other? Well, I think probably we had the Dragnet series emanate out of Los Angeles. At that time I was working in the juvenile unit. I did, uh, all of us, I believe, uh, experienced uh, a little more knowledgeable uh, type of crime on the part of the juvenile and, and the young adult offender. He wore gloves or socks, and he knew how to wear silk stocking masks and uh, some of the other things, as well as the vernacular in the police field. He, you, you don't think it accelerated the crime? It just, excel it just made it more proficient at it, is that? I think so. Well, they, had, they, had to, they had to pick up something from it to their own benefit, whoever viewed the program. What's the, what's the policeman's attitude toward television programs that sort of lampoon police officers? I'm referring to one where a car gets lost all the time. Uh, yeah, I know <laughs> the one you mean. Is it? Is it? It emanates from New York City, car 54. Uh, we, we did object to the, the light in which they do show a policeman, but I realized from the television viewpoint that the idea is to get a good program on the air, and uh, there are a lot of people that enjoy it every week. It is funny, and I guess in this day and age, with all the tension and all the trials and tribulations, we can use a program like that. And I'm sure it's not meant in any derogatory manner on the way of the TV uh, sponsors. I don't want to put you on any spots, and I know you don't speak for your associations. I would like a personal look, approval or disapproval on whether or not you like dogs in police work. This is becoming a, a national issue. Would you, just well, each of you, give me a quick uh, I comment? Like, uh, I, uh, I like the uh, use of dogs. I think that uh, it has its place in police work, and uh, I think it should be uh, uh, used sparingly. You buy that? This is something for the police commission in our city to decide, but I have read where it has been uh, very effective in some of the other cities throughout the country, and I guess it's quite the try, but it's up to the commission to decide. Right. The same, they say the same thing, I hope so. Substantially, yes. Right. We're most grateful to our guest, Lieutenant Robert Cutts of Los Angeles, a leader of some 8,000 men, Patrolman John Cassess of New York City, who is the head of 26,000 men, and Private George Whaler in the District of Columbia with some 3,500 men. We're most grateful for your informative and well, the, this discussion, and I'm sure has aided to all of us to better appreciate the role and problems of the police officer. My name is Mark Evans from Washington, D.C., on Opinion in the Capitol.